it is such a great time to reevaluate in some ways and totally. re totally. kind of just, you know, yep. Yep. Totally do agree. things differently in some respects, you know, totally agree. revenue enablement or go to market enablement or it's like, it doesn't matter. Call yeah, what it whatever it? you yeah. want. Yeah. It is such a great opportunity to, I don't know, kind of lean into all of the changes that are going on and figure out different ways to be that much more successful. So I don't know. I agree. It's, it's I, scary and fun at the same time. It is. I, I'm excited to get into it, uh, get into the, these questions with you. Yeah. Um, Cause I think there, there's a lot of different perspectives on it, yeah. but I think depending on where you at or where you've been or how long you've been in it, uh, it, I find that there is always still a consistent theme mm -hmm. and it needs to be voiced louder. Correct. Um, and so that that's why we're here. So yeah. I guess okay. with that said, let's let's get into it. Thank, thanks again, Susan, for joining us on Voices of Enablement. Excited to have you. Um, as you know, Voices of Enablement, we've really set this aside to have people like yourself who've been doing enablement for a while, experienced. <laughs> seen it a bunch of different ways, done yeah. a bunch of different ways um, to come on and really just help us understand how do we, given the economic, let's say headwinds to keep it nicely, how do we keep elevating enablement during this time? Because you know, what we see, unfortunately, is enablement a lot of time kind of gets pigeonholed into more of like a support function or right. this like cost center. Um, and those are unfortunately people that are first to go in an organization. And it's organizations like that, that need to have a better understanding of what enablement is, what yeah. it should be. Mm -hmm. And so we just want to create the space to to really unpack how do we how do we elevate enablement. So before we jump in, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you've been up to, oh, and uh, then we can jump into it. Yeah. So um, yeah, I guess from an experience perspective, I've been doing enablement um, training when it was called just yeah. training. What feels right. like way back when until we changed it to enablement um, operations, process improvements, you know, go to market strategies, things of that nature, and it's one of the um, things that I love about kind of what I do and enablement and things of that nature, because it really does, from my perspective, encompass all of that. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's some training. Yes, there's some process improvements. Yes, there's some go to market. Yes, there's looking at all of the different facets of the organization. And that to me is what I love about it, what I continue to, oh gosh, try to make better and better um, as, you know, different yeah. roles come up and things of that nature. But it's such a great, I don't know, it's such a great space. And I I think you and I have talked about it. I fell, just totally fell. I was a high school math teacher and yep. the, the right. CEO, I was doing some temp work and the CEO came to me and he's just like, hey, Susan, have you ever thought of doing you know, training? And I was like, what, for adults? Like, that's a thing? Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of cool. And he was really funny. He said, listen, if you can handle you know, 25, 16 uh, yeah. year olds, you can Way handle harder. salespeople. And that was the oh my gosh, this is a thing. Like I can pair all of this great stuff together. So um, yeah, as I said, fell into it and been loving it ever since and pulling in all sorts of different parts and pieces. So. I love it. Uh, oh, educator to educator. We've talked about that. Exactly. I get it. I totally get it. Yeah. Salespeople aren't easy, but they aren't high schoolers. So um, no, no, no. Could, be, could be worse. Could be worse. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, well, so let's, let's get into kind of the, the main topic, which is how the heck do we elevate enablement in an organization mm -hmm who maybe doesn't see it as like a strategic function yet because it it needs to be right it is mm -hmm. how do we how do we convince or maybe not convince but just prove to c suite with maybe our the, the things that we want to put into place or yep. you know the things that we've already put into place this is a strategic function how do we do it Correct. oh gosh i think there's um a few ways to do it first and foremost like at the beginning is really committing to and creating a I don't know, we call it a charter, we call it a, yeah. you know, whatever you want to call it, but it is really plan. defining, it's the plan, what enablement, what enablement is to the organization, who are they supporting, you know, what are the overall business drivers, because at the end of the day, I think the way that you elevate enablement and you keep it as a strategic function is to always tie it back to revenue objectives. Like I it. can't even stress it enough, whatever yeah. that happens to be. Maybe it's a new product launch. Maybe it's to, you know, increase revenue by X percent. Maybe it's getting into a new market, whatever it is, it's tying enablement programs back to the overall revenue objectives and being super, super clear about what enablement is and what it isn't. 
Yes. Um, I know you and I have talked and, and I know lots of people out there um, that I've spoken to and have been in this for a long time. And different companies define enablement differently. Totally and differently. So, you know, if you or if enablement or someone in the C-suite is just like, oh, that's just kind of a training function and all they do is onboarding, then that's all you're going to be and do because that's the that's what people think. So that's why yep. putting at my perspective, putting together that charter is the first step in elevating who enablement is and what they can do. Um, mm -hmm. And then really, it, it, I, I always sound like a broken record on it, but it's tying it back to business issues and it's tying it to revenue goals. And I think metrics, that's the metrics, metrics and revenue goals. Like that's the crux of it from my perspective. I think it's the answer. I do. Um, I, it's not easy yeah. to be clear. It's not easy, but right. I, I think that's definitely the answer. Um, you know, I, I think it's probably difficult to measure in a yes. lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I think there's probably an opportunity there, um, to figure out better ways to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think you're right. You got to kind of set the precedent up front. Like this is, I like how you said this, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm not going to do. Uh, I remember, I think it was at our Boston Roadshow. Someone yeah. talked about negotiating, like mm -hmm. negotiating what they're willing to do and not do and right. what does success look like and not, um, you know, what am I going to have responsibility over and not. I guess a really good way to put it because to your point, you you can end up just doing a bunch of tasks yep. that are kind of meaningless. And Correct. that's when you end up kind of getting thrown into this more of like a support function view. Correct. But if you come in with a plan and you say, this is how, this is what we're going to do. And this is how we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're not really going to take any shit yes. in between the lines. Then I think it's a really clear precedent to set. I really yeah. like it. So let's talk a little bit about the the charter then. Um, yeah. This is kind of mixing it up. But I, what are some of the things that you've either put in charters before or that mm -hmm. you plan on putting in charters in the future? Obviously, it's different yeah. per organization. But like, what are some of those specific yeah. things that you see in charters? Oh my gosh. Um, it, yeah. I have the picture in my brain of, you know, my overall template and it's really, um, it's things like who are the key stakeholders within the mm. organization? Um, sometimes it's the direct, you know, your first line manager, depending on where you are kind of rolling up within the organization. Um, I usually like to put the COO, head of sales, somebody at the top, because at the end of the day, that's really who you're yep. kind of reporting up into. Yep. Um, what are, like, what is your mission? What are your goals? Um, who do you support? Again, I think it's really critical because, um, you know, for some enablement folks, it's going to be inclusive of CS enablement or sales engineering or you know, internal groups. And I think it's really important to be very clear on who you're supporting versus who you're not supporting. Because mm. um, again, to your point, it's going to be a one size fits all. And um, I don't want to go too much, but you, if you have the charter first that says who we are, what we do, who we support, what are the overall kind of leading indicators and lagging indicators. So what are the things that we're going to measure, look to measure from a business perspective? Yeah. Because that I believe is the foundation for, okay, then how do you create the right programs to support that audience? How do you make sure that you've got the right tools in place based on who you're supporting and what it is that you're doing? Um, what groups that you're working with? So that to me is key, you know, who are some of those key stakeholders? And it's interesting because I've seen and I've, I've coached some folks on charters and they're like, oh, well, you know, that's sales. And I'm like, well, okay, that's, you're right. I said, but how are they going to get product knowledge? How are they going to get what I would consider soft skills? You know, how are they going to get development skills, things of that nature? So that's when you have to start thinking about, oh, wait a minute, I've got to work with marketing. I've got to work with product marketing. I've got to work yeah. with you know, engineering, I've got to work with all of these different people. So that charter is just something that grounds you within the organization, grounds your team, and quite frankly, grounds other people um, yeah. of what enablement is, what it doesn't do. Um, sure. Because I do think that that is super important. So again, long-winded way of netting it out of what is your mission? What is your values? Who are your key stakeholders in terms of reporting out, but also who you're going to be working with? And yep. then what are some of those key leading and lagging indicators that are going to kind of help show success, I guess, within yeah. the enablement organization. So you have to, yeah. And it's you just, to, it's, it's it. the platform and everybody from my perspective needs to buy into it. So whenever I've started a job, it's one of the first things I've done. And you go to all the different stakeholders and say, Hey, everybody in agreement, and you can go back and forth. Maybe 
there's an organization that has a super, super strong product marketing organization. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Maybe that's going to change your charter a little bit because they're going to do a lot. It, it's so that's why it really is defining, not in general, but for that company and mm -hmm. the role that it is that you're doing from a leadership perspective. Sounds like you're kind of a mediator between a oh, lot yes. of functions mm -hmm. for the sale. Obviously the sales reps are typically yep. your like customers Correct. for them yep. or, or CS reps or to mm -hmm. your point, whoever you're supporting, that's your customer. Yes. And you're mediating the business goals, objectives, and the, the support functions for those customers. Yeah. And how do we get to that business goal as an outcome? Um, and so to me, that feels like you go to C-suite mm -hmm. and you say, this is the value of enablement. This is right. what we do. We help you get your mission and vision to a level that can be tactically done Correct. by the reps. Correct. Yep. That can be executed. So right. it's the, what is the strategy? What can we do? What are the business issues? And then it goes into kind of execution mode in, yeah. in, in some respects. But unless, I, I, I firmly believe that unless you have that foundation of who we are, and most importantly, who we're not or what yep. we don't do, then then you've got that. And don't it, listen, I've done charters where it changed four months later and yeah, six months. It, it doesn't. And that's OK, because that yeah. to me means that people are thinking about it and there's ways that we are having the right conversations and elevating that function. Yep. Well, so let, let's let's uh, let's dig into kind of the maybe the responsibilities piece a little bit, because yes. this is interesting to me, because mm -hmm. you talk, depending on where an organization is, or, yep. you know, the priorities of that organization, obviously, those responsibilities are different. We just kind of talked about that. A responsibility that I see over and over and over and over and over again, and it almost feels a little over indexed to me yep. as a rep is onboarding, we got to okay. reduce ramp time, obviously, you got to do that, right? There, there, and, and enablement probably owns that as a responsibility. But do you feel like it's, it's become almost like synonymous with enablement? I yes. feel like it has. Yes. How and do you I, avoid that? Oh gosh, um, oh god, it, that that is a tough one because again, I think most of us, when you kind of go in and step into enablement, the first thing you get is we've got to fix, you know, onboarding. Our reps aren't rammed, uh, and it's it's again. I, I think that there is a space for that, but what I would say is a couple of things. One is start asking the questions of why. <laughs> okay. That, yes, it's important, but why, why do you want that to be the first thing? Like what's happening? Are reps that you're hiring, um, you know, not hitting their goals or they're not making or deals forever. or, yeah. you know, whatever. So understanding what it is that we're trying to solve, I think will help um, because I mean, I I've had these conversations in past roles where I was like, oh my gosh, you know, we've got to, and one of the first kind of questions that I ask is, are you hiring the right people? I'm going to say that. Is it, like, is it, is it the onboarding or is it the hiring process? Exactly. Exactly. Uh -huh. Like, what does that look like? And the other thing that I would say is, and I know that it's difficult to have the conversation, but I believe that enablement's job is certainly to help with that onboarding. But one of the things that I'm seeing and I've seen, oh gosh, throughout my career is we can't be, enablement can't be at all places at all times with new hires. Nope. First line managers have to have skin in the game. So yeah, I would can. say when they come in, they're like, okay, we got to do onboarding first. It's like, okay, one is what is the issue? What are, what are some of the issues that you're facing? It's taking too long or they're not getting this or, you know, what does that look like? And then second, what is the role of the frontline manager? And if the answer is, oh, I don't know, that's your job, not the frontline manager. You're like, oh boy, Red that's flag. a place that you need to start because it, we can, enablement can put together best training programs, you know, all the different tools, great content, but the frontline managers, the first frontline managers, they're the ones who make or break a rep. I, I really do believe we can help give them the tools, but they're the ones who are dealing with the reps on a day over day basis. So that's when I believe enablement needs to start thinking about, okay, all right, how can we support the frontline managers and what is their 30, 60, 90 day checklist, which I've done. If we really just matter, here's your checklist. Are you advice. doing these things? Um, you know, if you're, if you've got an LMS tool, you know, start, I mean, I'm just tactically thinking about, okay, if they're going to be doing uh, practice on a, you know, what is our value proposition? Okay. You get the frontline managers as part of that review process or whatever. Thing. Exactly. So I think that's where enablement can start being 
and it's and it's it's interesting. I also I look at enablement also in a very consultative manner as well. We need to we're experts in enablement, and we have to start asking the questions around not oh yeah 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 let me go do that, but why are we doing it? What is the business issue? Why are why are we not onboarding quickly? What are and what does what does success look like? You know, so many times it's like oh the onboarding program. And, and if you have someone in sales be like, oh, wow, we need to get them, you know, ramped up and being able to do their first sale within 30 days, you're like, oh, no, 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 no. So, uh, again, in a, a very long winded way to say, ask the questions around what isn't working today and what is so that you can start thinking about solving business issues. And then also asking what are the frontline managers doing and concentrate on both of those at the same time, because then you can start. I think putting together metrics, you know, how many times are you meeting with the frontline manager? How, mm -hmm. you know, what have you done? Have you put in like, there's so many tactical things that I think that you can do to try to measure both of those. I'm smiling. Cause I could, I mean, I could talk about this forever. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, sales rep, whole career. I feel like I've been adopted into the enablement family a little yes. bit. So I see both sides. Um, and I've been saying it, if I could say it louder, I would sales managers are the linchpin for this thing. Um, it is yeah. just no question about it. Uh, as a as a rep, I speak with my manager every day. They hold my job in their hands. Correct. So like, I am appealing to them at all costs. Correct. And if they haven't bought in to the enablement culture, or if they're not talking about it, correct. You best believe I'm not talking about it. I'm not thinking correct. about it. Correct. So I think it's a really really good point, and I like the idea of can you align tactically? Can you align with what that sales manager's yes. 30, 60 day, 90 plan is? Because that is really where you can figure out how to support them, Correct. which in turn means they're supporting you, which then means that the eyes of the seller are going to be on you. Correct. Which is what you're exactly. looking for. I yep. love it. Absolutely. I love it. The onboarding thing too. I could talk about that forever too. I, former former educator, mm -hmm. sold enterprise LMSs for a long time. It feels like that isn't the answer. Is just better onboarding, right? Like, no. We've been talking about onboarding for 15 years and sales is steadily right. declining. Correct. Is that a coincidence? Exactly. I think not. Right. Correct. Got to be something else. And I think you nailed it. It's this, you got to be a good sales rep. It's, mm -hmm. you know, the things you're saying are like, that's what good sales reps do. They ask those why questions. They ask, right. what's the impact? What does success look like? Yeah. And then take a step back and be a little more consultative. Like you said, I think it's right. really, really good feedback, really good insight. And people who maybe feel like they're just constantly doing random acts of enablement, which is what we talk about a lot. We hear that a lot. Yeah. It's like random acts of enablement. People who are feeling that way are probably people. Who haven't taken a step back yeah. and said, I'm not signing up for this. I'll sign up for this because I've identified that this is the problem and this is the root. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, so yeah. good. And it's, and at the end of the day, onboarding is, yes, you want to do the, the, the onboarding and get people up and, and working, but we also know, and again, I've been working with salespeople my whole career. It mm -hmm. is that's that's not it you know learning about the product and the solution and how do you position it and all of those types of things that's that's fine but it doesn't ever stop there's nope. new product launches that are happening there's you know different markets that folks need to get into there are different right like there's so many other parts and pieces if you're just concentrating on those new reps you're you're you're, you're missing all of the other stuff and this is also where i start having the conversations and looking about it from a metric perspective mm -hmm. you know again my i was a math teacher as well so my brain goes through a lot yeah. of those, you know math things and it's sort of like well hey wait a minute you know it's there's there's lots of other parts and pieces in terms of onboarding are you hiring the right people do they have the right territory are they a hunter versus a farmer are you dealing with sdrs bdrs and in some instances those roles are just, hey, I'm going to make an appointment and what's that handoff? And you're like, okay, well, then you have to start looking at onboarding mm -hmm. across multiple roles, multiple experience levels oh, yeah. throughout the sales cycle. And it's not, you know, again, that's why for me, part of the big thing about onboarding is what is it? What is the definition of being onboarded? Is it your yeah. first deal? Is it your first, like, what is that? Because then you can start kind of measuring and looking at that. So, you know, I, and again, I've done this at other companies where you're looking at, you know, competencies and onboarding, you know, behavioral interviewing yep. questions. Like, are you even getting the right folks? And hey. again, I can go off. Well, I think you and I have chatted about this. I could go off and spend a lot of time on competency models and traits versus skills. Like, because enablement can help with the skills. 
Yep. We can train to skills. We can enable to skills. I cannot enable on a trait. I can't make okay. someone motivated. I can't make someone inquisitive. I can't make, those are traits. And that I believe you definitely wanna hire for some of those traits, but that's where you know interviewing questions and asking the right hiring questions will get you to that trait. So yep. But I can't, I, I, I just remember um, at, at a couple of companies, you know, I, I put together the competency model and, you know, my boss was like, well, wait a minute, you know, where's the, um, you know, intuitive or where's the, and I was like, I can't, I can't put a program around how to be no. more intuitive or right. how to be more, um, you know, I can put together programs Hard around working. how do you ask good open-ended questions versus closed. Yeah. I can put together programs on that, but I, I, I can't train you to be inquisitive. I can't. I, I, so I true. Can't. That's very true. It's very good. Um, man, there's a lot to unpack there. Oh, yeah. we'll, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll move on from that because that's a good one. Um, so let's actually talk about, because the theme is economic headwinds, let's talk about when you aren't hiring. Yeah, There is no onboarding. Nope. So if you're an enabler that is strictly done onboarding and now you're not onboarding, you're probably going, oh, shit, what do I do? Exactly. So for those in that position, what would you say? What Where, where should you turn your focus? Again, I would turn my focus on asking the questions of, okay, we're not hiring. So there's a reason why we're not hiring. Yep. Is that because we're not hitting our revenue goals? Is that because, um, you know, we, we need to move up market and we're, so what are those business issues that mm -hmm. the organization is trying to solve? And I think that is key. And, and you've got to ask those questions. And you know, this is an opportunity from my perspective, if enablement hasn't been doing this, which I highly recommend that you do, is working with each one of the leaders and all across of what are the issues that you're facing? Where are your reps, current reps struggling? Um, this is where you could start to put together, and I know people don't like the word surveys, but getting out and asking the sales yeah. organization, Be back. Be back what issues are you facing? Are yeah. you, um, you know, what are Again, it's the broken record of what is the business issues that are happening within the organization and then working out from a strategic perspective of what can enablement help? Exactly. Yep. What can we impact? You know, mm -hmm. maybe it is, oh my gosh, there's these brand new competitors out in the market and I got nothing to compete against them. Okay, great. Then let's work with product marketing and let's work with the competitive intelligence and let's, you know, then then enablement can start putting together programs for okay, how do you go up against this, you know, competitor? What are the types of questions that you want to ask? Let's work with product marketing because we need a one sheeter on A, B, and C. Oh, geez. We know based on other conversations that these reps over here have faced that competitor and here's what they did. Great. Let's put together a session and share best practices. Like there's so many different things that enablement can do and can provide. It's not just about, let me sit in front and, and talk with you. Let me, you know, it, there's so many different ways because I really truly believe that enablement is that it's that that's, you know it's the hub of the wheel and we can work with with different groups to kind of pull that together and listen that is not to say that we are the blocker and that you can't do anything without going through us but we are I believe in a great enviable position of getting directly to the source and directly to the organization so start having the conversations if you haven't done so all of the sales leaders, all of the marketing folks, what's coming up, what new products might need to be, you know, launched. How can we work together on, um, you know, rolling out a particular program? Cause it's not just about, Hey, here's the product feature functionalities. There's, and again, whew, lots to unpack messaging. with that one as well, but it's, it's thinking about it from a consultative perspective and always asking the question of what is happening? What are the issues that you're mm -hmm. facing? So that then the right programs can be put into place to support that. Now, the only caveat that I will make is we all have worked with sales leaders. We've all worked with salespeople and it's always, well, we're different and we need this and we need that, yep. da, da, da. but it's a good opportunity as again, as an enablement team and as a, in a consultative way is hearing all of those different par parts and pieces. And then I would argue that nine and a half times out of 10, there's a common thread. <laughs> there's some commonality that's coming up in different, in Very different true. ways. Great. Then those become maybe the prioritized programs um, yeah. that enablement then can put into place, but look at it from a business issue, because that will also allow you to say, what is the measurement of success so that enablement can quite frankly, take some credit for things that yeah. we've put together. And 
Sometimes there's not a direct correlation, Sorry. but it's a way to get measurements into the C-suite to say, here's what we've influenced. Here's what we've yep. helped to um, enhance. Yep. I love it. Two more questions for you. Oh boy. As we're talking about this, one is loaded. Yeah. The other is very simple. So I'll end <laughs> with a simple one. Okay. This one's kind of loaded because right. it's a tough one. All right. How do you get salespeople to buy into these programs? Oh, man. Um, what I would say the simplistic way of is again asking the question of why is a salesperson going to care about this program? How is it now? Again, well, not to disparage any salespeople. Come on, bring it. <laughs> it's, it's very simple. How is this going to make me more money? How is this going to help me in front of my customers? How is this going to help? How is this going to save me time? Yep. It, in some ways, it's Goodbye. really easy. And if, if you think about it that way, so the program is in, in my, in, in my brain is here's the business issue. And then here is why you're going to care about that. Mm -hmm. That is going to allow you to have, let's say it's around discovery. That's going to allow you to understand the business issue and position the, you know, appropriate solution. This is going to help you get more, more product. Or yeah. Whatever. This is going to help you in your renewals. This is going to have help you upsell. This is going to help you do X, Y, and Z. So in, in its simplest format, it's listening and understanding what is the motivation for that salesperson and how do you create programs asking and answering the questions of how does this help them? How does this get more customers? How does this in some ways in its simplest format, make them more money? because the, that's sales. a huge motivation from sales. So it's a yep. carrot or a stick in some ways. It is, it's true. how is this going to um, alleviate administrative tasks that no salesperson wants to do? Right. How is this going to help you know, have more conversations, save them time? Like whatever that happens to be, how does it save them time, make more money, make them more productive? And like it's it can be that And what is, I, I, I said I was going to ask two more. This is right. part two of the first question. So I'm still okay. going to ask two. All right. Um, how, what is the balance between collective training or coaching or programs yep. mm -hmm. and customized one-on-one -on -one programs coaching? Ooh, um, I believe that you need both, but mm -hmm. I think this is where you have to partner with your Manager. first line sales managers because I, you know, enablement it's, it's, and you also hear in um, me say a lot of that kind of 70, you know, 30, 80, 20, whatever that happens to be of, overall broad brushed versus the the specifics of that yeah. but then this is where that specificity is really within different parts of the organization so you know for because it's it can't all be enablement um so again nope. i have worked in different companies where you know if you're launching particular products the way you would go to market in france is different than latin america sure. is different sure. than asia okay great I'm yep. not going to build 85 different programs for those little niches. I'm going to go broad. Here's yep. the program. And then let me work with the French team on, okay, what are some of the modifications that we need to make for this? Or what do yeah. we need to add? Or what do we need to change? But I really believe that individual kind of coaching, that is the frontline manager. Because if they've got six or seven. It's doable. It's, it's, it's absolutely manageable. So our job is to get everybody to hear your job as a sales leader is if you've got one person who's here all right what what can we yeah. do but yeah. that's also where i think feedback comes in as well with the programs from the frontline managers is to say oh yeah. yeah you know what this piece is great but i'm really all of my reps are having a struggle with this how do we this is where you collaborate how do we beef up this to to hit more of the collective but your job as a frontline manager is the individual day-to-day -day coaching spot on spot on spot on I completely agree. I've, um, as a, here's an example I've seen okay. done for me as a sales rep, previous company, me and my sales manager, great relationship. Uh, we were in like a pod structure. Yep. So I think there was like six of us, maybe something like that. And, um, one, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, you have a one-on-one -on -one every, every oh, yeah. yep. one, one-on-one -on -one a quarter is, was it a quarter? Maybe it was, uh, yeah, I think it was a quarter. Okay. One, one-on-one -on -one per quarter, instead of he and I talking, he would bring in our head of enablement. Yeah. Just for me. Yeah. And the three of us would discuss where am I struggling? Where yep. could I use some assistance? Yada, yada, yada. And so then the two of them could go and say, Ooh. okay, this is what we want to put together. This is what he needs help on. The manager yep. would obviously be 
the biggest proponent of getting that into my workflow. Correct. But the enablement manager was assisting with putting that together. Correct. To me, that was probably the best example of this like mutual buy-in because Correct. I instantly now bought into this enablement leader. Yeah. And to this day, I, I think very highly of him. Yeah. By the way, was never a former bag carrier. I know everyone thinks like, oh, if you've never carried a bag, you can't be an enablement. I think I call mm -hmm. bullshit. If you do it I right, if you do it right, uh, it can be done. That Correct. was a good example. And so I think, I think you're right. You've got to have this like mutual buy-in uh, mm -hmm. for it to work. Correct. And it, it has to be consistent. It has to be Correct. consistent. And so. I, I think that's where enablement, if you ask the, if you answer the business issues, then you're providing value to the sales organization. And if you can provide value, then you get more yep. buy-in. And then it just becomes just a much easier kind of conversation. You're not feeling like you're pushing a rock uphill. Exactly. All right. Last question, switching gears, much easier question. Love it. Um, obviously a lot of folks are struggling yep. and actively interviewing for jobs, looking oh, for yeah. jobs. There's a lot of that going on. What are some of the things you're looking for in an organization that go, yeah, that's a place that I would like to work in enablement in versus what are maybe some red flags? And I think you've mentioned one or two, actually, that mm -hmm. you could say in this portion as well. What are some of the red flags that would make you go, ah, not sure if I want to work in enablement in a company like this? Yeah. So um, a few things and, you know, been there, done that. So it's it's things that I do. If you start looking at the job description and it's like 85 bullets and it's like all of these different things. That to me is, it might not be a red flag, but it might be an orange one, a conversation to say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Like, this looks like you want enablement to do Checklists. all of these things. And oh, by the way, that's when you can be like, okay, well, how big is the team? Or, um, yeah. you know, what is the focus? Things of that nature. So it might not necessarily be a red flag, but it's definitely something to think about of, okay, wait a minute, does this organization think that this is just an execution arm, in which case Project I'm not going to be manager. a partner and a, st a strategist. Yeah. Um, and I do think that it's really important as folks look for different, you know, roles that the the red flags don't look at a title as a red flag. Don't look Advice. like it. It doesn't. It doesn't necessarily because again, I am seeing head of, leader of, senior director, director, VP, you name it. it that to me is not as impactful as okay. Start looking at the job description and what are some of the things that it says about what the role are and what the responsibilities are um you know how big is the team you can start having kind of some of those conversations um i would also just from a red flag perspective look about where does it roll into because mm. <clears throat> again mm -hmm. i think that can help or hinder an enablement organization so and again it's not i don't want to disparage anything but for me if the enablement is going to roll up under marketing my little spidey sense is going to go off and say, oh, no, 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 that's going to be focused on, you know, product and that, but okay, content. content, like, okay, wait a minute. Again, it might not, I don't necessarily think that there's any huge red flag that you're like pound sand. I'm not even going to apply yeah. for that. But and I, I would encourage it. people to look yeah. at things that are slightly outside of what they might be looking at, because again, it's an opportunity to ask True. questions and to influence because a lot of times they might not know exactly. They're kind of trying to figure it out. Okay, great. You can kind of help to, to, to do that. So again, I would look at where it's rolling up into, what are the types of activities that you're going to be doing? And if it's everything, you know, if the first bullet is, you know, concentrating on onboarding, again, like think about that and go, um, right, onboarding is a, it, it, onboarding, you know, unless you are, oh God, I can't even like think of an industry where it's just constant. Like it, it, there's going to be an ebb and a flow. And if, if that's the only concentration, again, I would say, ask some questions, ask some really specific ones on, okay, I know that that's important, but what else, like yep. <laughs> what else is going on? And then, you know, we all need to do it. Look at the business and the economy and, and what's going on with that line of business, you know, go on their website, you know, do they have, you know, um, different leaders and structures and do they have like do does it look based on that that there is an, an enablement culture a training culture a development culture yeah. um those to me are great again not red flags but things to think about within the company are they going to support the enablement organization the way um as, as a contributor as a leader that i would want to see i love it susan you're the best this, ah! honestly good advice on so many levels about so many topics. I'm really excited for everyone to listen to this. 
excited. To, I mean, it was totally my mistake. I literally thought I hit send to get you <laughs> the Calendly link to book this. And then I realized that I didn't. I'm so <laughs> glad that I saw it and was like, oh my God, what was I doing? <laughs> I mean, what an, what an idiot. Um, so, so happy to have you on. Tell everybody where, where, they, where can they find you Is on LinkedIn? What's, I, what are you up yep. to? I am on LinkedIn. Um, I am, I, I'm, I'm happy to say that I have been an ambassador, one of the leaders of the Sales Enablement Society, great, great organization, wow. um, Sales Enablement Pro, the go-to-market buddy. Um, so you can find me in all of those different locations. And honestly, I am, I love connecting people and talking about all this kind of good stuff. So find me on LinkedIn. Um, the picture that you will see, unless I update it between now and then is going to look very different, but I'm, I'm working on that one right now. So you can find it under shoes and Savannah. Me too. I was like, my picture's from like 30 pounds ago. So uh, yeah, I mean, it is. Exactly. I'm, 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 mine's in the, you know, pre COVID hair. So just, but I'm there connect. I'd love to help answer questions, coach, do whatever it is that I need to do. I just, I think that this is just such a phenomenal group of people in general Agreed. in the enablement field. And it's just, I think it's a really good time to be in it. It feels really scary right now, but There's let's all kind happening. of get together and elevate it yeah. right up. I feel, a, I feel a wave, a change yeah. in uh, currents, if you will. Yeah, so me too. I think, I think you're right. I think it is a really yeah. good time. And it's so awesome. great to talk with you. Um, you too. So thank you very much for including me and inviting me on this. Of course. And uh, we got to come to Boston again. So when we do, we'll see you there. Let's do it. Sounds awesome. good. Bye, Susan. Thanks. Later.